few years ago, I was in a, in a bar in a hotel in, in Rwanda with a couple of people. We were, we were part of a UN mission. and We'd spent the day assessing conditions in a refugee camp. And so we, we, were, we were sitting around having a beer debriefing. And one of the guys said to the other two, whenever I meet people like you who have traveled a lot, I always ask myself, what are you escaping from? Because I don't believe anybody travels that much who isn't escaping from something. Now, according to my frequent flyer mile memberships, um, I've traveled over a million miles by air. And well, I like to, you know, I like to, to point out that air travel is about five times more efficient than car travel, which I hardly ever do. But a million miles, that's a big number. And it needs a little bit of justification, especially if it's a million miles spent escaping something. Now, at the time, I couldn't really think of what I was escaping. I wasn't escaping my, my childhood. I wasn't escaping my past. I grew up in Quebec, and I loved it. I came from a strong family. I loved the long winters. I loved the, the rugged environment. I loved the culture, the people. I had a great time growing up. But I always knew that I wanted to get out there and see the world. I always knew that I wanted to, to witness some of the things you read about, the, the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, or, the, or Stonehenge, or the Midnight Sun. You know, Lake Como, Gothic cathedrals, things like that. I wanted to get out and see them. And my opportunity came when I was a student, when I was a college student. And I got to study abroad, spend a year in Paris. And I saw a lot of the things that I'd read about. And they were remarkable. And I knew that I wanted to travel. I fell in love with every aspect of traveling. I loved picking a destination. I loved reading about a place. I loved searching for tickets. I loved packing. I loved that day of departure when you know it really is going to happen. That, imi that imminent sense of change. I love it when you, when you, that moment of madness, when you step into this sort of aluminum, this large aluminum soda can with huge engines that's going to carry you 30,000 feet up in the air with a group of total strangers. I love that. I love when you land and you step into something that's completely unfamiliar, where there aren't those routines that we have, that we develop, so that we can cope with the endless stream of email and the long to-do list. You're disengaged from them. And all of a sudden, this, your, senses, your senses switch on. And you start to absorb all sorts of new information. You realize what your brain is capable of processing. I love that feeling. And I love coming home. I love coming home and looking at the familiar with fresh eyes and deepening my appreciation for things that I've always taken for granted. So I knew I wanted travel to be a permanent part of my life. And I figured the easy way to do that was to become a professor. So I decided to do a PhD in international relations. And I thought, That's, I will have the life. For the next four or five decades of my life, I will go back and forth between Europe and the United States. It would be fantastic. I couldn't imagine a better life. And so I did a PhD in international relations. I thought, well, when I teach, I want to demonstrate to students that the concepts and the theories of international relations are valuable. And the way to do that is to show them that they can provide insight into things that are happening in the world, into real world events. So I decided that I would teach, that I would start teaching by talking about the, how, how, how well our field helped us understand what was going on in the world. When I started teaching, my very first class took place in the, in the fall after the genocide in Rwanda. And so I thought, well, this is a good thing to teach about, the genocide in Rwanda. That's, that's something that's big and important, and we can use international relations theories to understand why it happened and how it happened and who was responsible and what should have been done and so on. And so I met my first class. I said, let's talk about Rwanda. And I felt almost immediately completely uncomfortable doing that. And the reason I felt uncomfortable was because I had never stepped foot in Africa. I had never stepped foot in Rwanda. And I really didn't feel that I had the authority to talk at all about something of that scale. And so at that moment, my ambition for travel changed dramatically. I decided that the type of travel I wanted to do was to take me to those places that we read about, that are in the headlines, that sometimes we form very strong opinions about, but we almost never have direct first-hand experience with. Places in countries like Pakistan and Nepal and Sri Lanka and Cambodia, places experiencing a lot of upheaval throughout the Middle East and Africa. I worked in Congo, I worked in Sierra Leone, I worked in Rwanda. I worked in places suffering extreme conditions, extremely high levels of turbulence. And they're not representative 
of those areas. They're not representative often of the countries in which they're taking place. These types of problems are, are liberally scattered around the entire surface of the planet. And, and sometimes we think that those, that those specific problems are representative of the entire society. That's a mistake. That's a distortion. But when I started traveling to these places, I mean, my senses really switched on. But also, a lot of the stereotypes and preconceptions I had about those places started to switch off. I started to get a better sense of what it means to experience war, to live surrounded by landmines, to be forced to leave your home, to, to move into a camp, because I was working in those places. And, and having those experiences certainly enriched my teaching. I came back into the classroom and I could talk a little bit more authoritatively of what these places look like. But I also realized that I had to do a little bit more than teaching. I had to be more deeply involved. So I started to work on the ground with organizations that were set up to try and empower and protect people in extreme circumstances wherever they might be on the planet. And I worked with a number of organizations, especially with the United Nations, with, in teams of, of really dedicated, passionate, experienced people who are just trying, just trying to find ways to help people who are experiencing high levels of turbulence and violence and, and deprivation. I did, I've done this throughout my career, and often one of the questions that people ask me is, is why do you do this? Because let's face it, there's a billion people facing hunger, a billion people living in extreme poverty. There's millions of people experiencing war. There always has been. And you're not really ever going to change that, are you? In fact, there's lots of research that suggests that maybe getting involved in these places is more, does more damage than good. That maybe when you blunder into these places, you cause more problems than you really ever saw. And I thought of that. I thought of that a lot. Is this really true? Is this, is this, is this, is this, you know? Because there's no doubt that a lot of the problems are complicated problems. They're daunting problems. They're structural problems. And it's not easy to go in and change these things. Um, but my experience on the ground has been largely different than that. I think that those arguments sometimes can become an easy rationale for not doing anything. Those problems are too difficult. We're never going to make a difference. And we're probably going to make things worse. So why do anything at all? And what I've really discovered is that in a lot of these situations, there's a whole lot that can be done that's accessible, that's within our grasp. The people who are living there, they often have pretty good ideas of how to, of a next step that will really improve the situation dramatically. But it's all too often the next step is held in check by something that when you look at it objectively, you say, that could be changed. That thing could be changed. And that's a bridge that we can create. We can come in with sometimes we can change things. Friends, a couple of friends who have worked with me on these things call it a sort of philosophy of engagement, sort of small change, better world. And I don't want to be naive about this. There are some big, complicated problems that are very hard to change. And small changes. Small changes which can improve the lives of people you know, don't come without any risk. There's always the risk that you can mess things up. But there's something nice about the scale. There's something nice about the scale because there's a little bit more opportunity to experiment, to correct course. And I think above all, those are situations in which you can really listen to the people who are going to have to live with the consequences of whatever you do. So you can get a really good sense. Does this make sense to you? Would this help you? I'll give you a couple of examples from, our, from the work that we've been involved in. We were in a little village in Sierra Leone, very remote village, utterly destroyed during the war. Everything was destroyed except for one water tank. And when the people came back, they looked at this big pile of rubble. And they had students, they had a lot of young people, they had teachers, they had a curriculum, but the school had been destroyed. So they started holding classes outside, in the rain, in the you know, blistering sun. It was very tenuous and, and, and difficult. And a woman, about a year before I got there, a woman had, had visited that town, that small village, and she said, uh, she said, I can help you with this. And she arranged to have some concrete and some building materials delivered to this very remote area. And when we got there, the people had just opened the school that they had built. And a situation which was very tenuous, very unpredictable, very difficult, had suddenly become a situation a permanent, that was a permanent feature of their community a stable educational system, a source of not just pride, but of possibility. We were in another little village, and the people were coming back after the war. And the older people in the community said, we, we want to 
we want to pass our traditions on to the next generation, but all the music, uh, but they're, they're very dependent on musical instruments and everything was, has been destroyed. We have nothing. And we don't really know how to, re how, to, how, to, how to change the situation. We don't really know how to rebuild these instruments. And my friends and I looked at them and said, that's the sort of thing we can do. We can, we can help get those instruments in there so that you can continue on. Because so many times, we think of these situations as impossible. Nothing can be done. But actually, actually, a small change can make a huge amount of difference. We were in, a, in, a, in another village, and uh, a group of well-meaning people had, dug, had drilled tube wells. Because the, the, the surface water that the communities depended on was very polluted. So the idea was dig some tube wells, give, them an, uh, give the people an alternative. But when we got there, all of the wells were dry. All of the wells were dry. And the people were back to using this very contaminated surface water. But it soon became clear that one of the reasons they were dry is because nobody had ever bothered training them in well management. So it wasn't that the, that the wells were a bad idea, and it wasn't that the people couldn't learn to operate them. It was that, that they needed a couple of days of training like anybody else might. That was the difference between having a reliable source of high quality water and not. And I think there are thousands of opportunities like this. Opportunities where a, sm a small amount of assistance can, can translate into a huge amount of, of benefit. And so, and so you know, I, I, I think that you know, if I was in a bar tonight and somebody asked me, asked me you know, um, why, do you, why do you travel? What are you escaping from? I'd probably say something more like, you know, I, I, I've escaped from that sense of being overwhelmed by the challenges of the 21st century, that sense of, of being helpless, that sense that what I do doesn't matter, that sense that no matter what I do, it's probably going to be the wrong thing. Because I think there are real opportunities. There are real opportunities to engage in these places where the situations are extreme and acute and the needs are huge. And often they're much less daunting than we think. Often when we go there, we find out that somebody from outside can bring a little bit of leverage into that situation that clears away an obstacle and makes a whole lot of things possible. So I'm not daunted. I agree that there are huge problems. I agree that we'll have problems for a long time. But I also agree that, there's, that this is not a basis for doing nothing. That a lot of the time, as long as we're sensitive, as long as we're listening, as long as we're being attentive to the people that we're trying to help, wherever they are, whether they're in New Orleans or Mexico or Rwanda, as long as we're being attentive, we can make a difference, a meaningful difference. I don't want to be naive about it, but I do want to stress that it's important, that we can be, that we have tremendous tools at our disposal, and we can use them to help improve the lives of people all over the world. And sometimes those people are not that far away from, from where we're standing. And so based on my own experience, I think, I think travel is, is, is wonderful. And I encourage you, break, break away from the familiar, the safe, and go. Go, switch on your senses, go. Go out there and see the remarkable things, the huge stocks of ingenuity that everybody on this planet has. Go and get a sense of some of the things that keep that from being actualized. Go to clarify what you want to do with your life. Go to deepen your appreciation of all the things that you have here. Go to expand your network. Go, because Every one of you can help change something important that just needs a little bit of help to be changed. Thank you.